All right, so let's talk about how we can select those hyperparameters. There are um, a number of questions uh, that we might ask uh, for practically uh, utilizing the things that we learned about in this lecture. How do we know if we are overfitting or underfitting? How do we select which algorithm to use? How do we select the hyperparameters? One idea is to make these choices based on whatever makes the loss low. But that's not a good idea, because things like hyperparameters, the choice of which features to use, the choice of which algorithm to use, all these choices have to trade off bias and variance. But just looking at the training loss doesn't tell us about whether we're suffering from bias or variance. Um, well, it, it tells us we're suffering from bias, but it doesn't tell us much about variance because our training loss might be zero, but we might have overfitted heavily. So training loss doesn't, isn't enough to figure out what the variance is. We can't diagnose overfitting by just looking at the training loss. So we need a better workflow. So the machine learning workflow would go like this. You take your data set, data set may be quite large, and, you, and then you'll separate it into a training set and what we call a validation set. And typically the training set might be you know, 80 to 90% of the data set and the validation set will be a little bit that's left over. Um, by the way, if you're wondering why the training set is larger than the validation set, um, think about it a little bit more once I finish the slide and uh, maybe ask a question about that if it's not clear. Okay, so the training set, as the name implies, is what you're going to use for training. And I'm going to use L theta comma D train to denote the training loss here. So before I call this L theta, but now I'm going to make it explicit that it depends on D train. So I'll actually write it as L theta comma D train. It, it's the same thing as before. I'm just using notation that makes it clearer that it depends on the training set. And then the validation set is kind of reserved. You're not going to use it for training. You're going to hold it in reserve for the purpose of selecting your hyperparameters adding or removing features, tweaking your model class, or making any of those other choices uh, that, are, that are needed uh, to design your method. And I'm going to call the loss on the validation set L theta comma D val. So L theta comma D val is what will allow us to diagnose overfitting and underfitting. Why? Well, because overfitting is characterized by the case where your empirical risk is low, but your true risk is high. L theta comma D train is your empirical risk. L theta comma D val uses data that was not used for training, which means that it is unbiased estimator of the true risk. So by comparing L theta D train and L theta D val, you can determine if you're overfitting or underfitting. So the machine learning workflow that you would typically use will look like this. Train your parameters theta on L theta comma D train. If L theta comma D train is not low enough, if basically if you're not happy with the training loss that you're, get, you're, you're getting, then that means you're underfitting. So if you're training your cat versus dog classifier, and on the training set your error is, let's say, 35%. 35% is a pretty bad training error. Like if you just guess cat dog randomly, you would get 50% error. In a binary classification problem, maybe you want errors like 5 10%, right? So 35% you're not happy with, you're underfitting, change something to re reduce underfitting. What do you do to reduce underfitting? Think about this for a second. Well, you can decrease regularization. Less regularization means a better fit. You can improve your optimizer. You can add more features, add more parameters, use a bigger, better model. If you've done all that and your training loss, your L theta D train, is low enough and you're happy with it, then look at L theta D val. When you look at L theta D val, one of the things to watch for is if L theta D val is much larger than L theta D train. So maybe your cat versus dog classifier has a training error of 1%, but the validation error is 20%. Well, that probably means that you are overfitting. If you are overfitting, you can increase the amount of regularization uh, or do other things that somehow reduce your model capacity. You could also go out and get more data. And once you've done that, um, you can repeat the process.
Okay, now we talked about hyperparameters before. Hyperparameters, um, well, hyperparameters can affect regularization, they can also affect other things. So, the training set is used to select, is used to select what? Well, it's used to select theta, but that's done automatically, that is training. Your optimization algorithm will select theta for you. That's what, what a machine learning algorithm does. It can also be used to select hyperparameters that affect optimization. So it should not be used to select hyperparameters for regularization, but it can be used to select hyperparameters that affect optimization, such as the learning rate alpha. Right? These hyperparameters, their, their purpose is to minimize your training loss. They're not trying to reduce overfitting, they're just trying to minimize training loss, things like learning rate. So you can use those, you can use your training set to select those, because you're just trying to get the lowest training loss. But the validation set can be used to select your model class, like are you using logistic regression or a neural net? Is it a neural net with 10 layers or 20 layers or 160 layers? It can be used to select the parameters of your regularizer, that lambda. Um, it can be used to select which features to use, all this stuff. So basically, the validation set will be used to select those things that influence overfitting. And they will be selected so as to avoid overfitting. Okay, uh, now in practice, so, so I have this, this workflow which made it look very stage-wise, like you train your, your model on your training set, you mess with it for a bunch, and then you look at the validation set. But in practice, we don't actually do it this way, we do something a little bit more interleaved. We look at learning curves, and you'll be looking at learning curves a lot in this class. So a learning curve is a graph where the horizontal axis is the number of gradient steps or the number of optimizer steps in general. Often we'll use gradient descent or some variant thereof, but the x-axis represents some kind of optimization progress. Whatever optimizing optimization algorithm you use, it's basically the number of iterations of that algorithm that have proceeded. The vertical axis is the loss. And what we often look at is the training loss and the validation loss plotted uh, on the same axes, or maybe on two separate axes side by side. So. Let me show you what a training loss and a validation loss might look like over the course of optimization. So initially, both training loss and validation loss are high. Why are they high initially? Well, because you haven't trained anything, right? Initially, you just have some arbitrary random thetas. They're going to get a bad loss. And they tend to go down pretty rapidly at first. Usually, the training loss will be a bit lower than the validation loss. It's very unusual for the validation loss to be lower because you're actually optimizing the training loss and the validation loss is kind of keeping up, it's kind of following along. So maybe then you see something like this, and then you see this, right? Okay, what's going on here? Is this underfitting or overfitting? What about this? Okay, so these are two potential learning curves you might have gotten, maybe for two different settings, of your regularizer hyperparameters. Maybe you had a pretty low lambda on the left and a pretty high lambda on the right. So the curve on the left is stereotypical overfitting. Initially, both losses will be going down. That will almost always happen. But later on, the validation loss actually starts going up as the training loss drops further. What's happening there is that your learned function is fitting better and better to those training points at the expense of actually deviating from the true function everywhere else. And you will often see when you're overfitting that the validation loss actually starts going up after a while. On the right, we have a classic example of underfitting. The validation loss and the training loss stay pretty similar, but they don't go down as low as we would like. And that gap at the end, that is bias. Basically, the magnitude of that gap is the bias in your algorithm. Okay, um, so a textbook answer to what you do here is, well, if you see the thing on the left, then increase regularization. If you th see the thing on the right, then decrease regularization. But looking at these curves, some of you might also be wondering, can we just like stop the optimizer right at that point where the validation error is minimized? Like, forget regularization. Like, you've got the curve, you see the validation error, just stop it when the validation error is low. Is that a good idea? Should we be doing that? Take a moment to think about that 
tell me if you think this is a good idea or not. If this is live, you can type it in the chat. If you're watching it online, maybe uh, consider uh, the answer uh, in your head. Is this a good idea? Well, it's not a bad idea. You could totally do this. In fact, my next question is, how do you know when to stop? So let's say that you're optimizing and optimizing and optimizing, and you'd like to hit that sweet spot before the validation error goes up. How do you know when to stop? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. You've got the validation error. You've got the validation loss. Just look for when the validation loss starts going up, and if it's been going up pretty consistently for the past you know, 20 iterations, just rewind 20 steps and take whatever you had back then. In deep learning, this is called early stopping, and it is actually a legitimate way to mitigate overfitting. My next question is, does this mitigate all overfitting? Does this negate the need for regularization? Well, the answer is no, it doesn't. Because even if you can stop the optimizer right at that sweet spot, the validation error might never get as low as it could have if you had used appropriate regularization. So early stopping is one way to combat overfitting, but it doesn't solve all your problems. You still want the other tools in your toolkit. Okay, the last concept that we're going to talk about, which is a very important one, is the final exam. I don't mean in this class. This class actually doesn't have a final exam. But your model has a final exam. So let's say you followed this recipe. You did everything I described in my slides. And you're done. You don't have underfitting. You don't have overfitting. Your losses are all good. You're happy. Now what? Your boss comes to you and, and says, oh, you've been working on this thing for a month. How good is your model? What do you tell them? Well, you could tell them what the validation loss is. Is that a good idea? Think about that for a second. Tell me if you think this is a good idea or not. Maybe you can, you can put it in the chat. It's no good. We already used the validation set. We used it to select our hyperparameters. Therefore, we can't really rely on the validation loss being unbiased anymore. In a sense, our training loss couldn't be used to select our hyperparameters because our training loss was used to train theta. In the same way, our validation loss can't really be used to report our final performance because our validation loss was used, in a sense, to train our hyperparameters. Typically, that's a manual process, not an automated one, but still. We can't really use the validation loss as a representative uh, quantification of our final error, because we've already used it for something. It's not unbiased anymore. It is not statistically independent uh, of our model, because they are coupled through the hyperparameters, which were selected using the validation loss. So what if we just do the same thing again? We reserved the validation set so that we could pick hyperparameters using something that was not polluted by training. What if we reserve another slice of the data set for the final exam as a kind of like a validation validation set? Well, we can totally do that. So instead of partitioning our data set into two parts, we'll partition it into three parts. A training set, a validation set, and a test set. And the test set here is shown in white. Why is it white? Well, it's white and pristine like fresh snow. It hasn't been polluted yet. So your validation set and your training set, they're like dirty snow that your optimizer has driven over many, many times. They've been polluted. They're, they're no longer pure. They're no longer fresh. Your test set needs to be pure. It needs to not have been used for anything yet. And that's very important because if it has been used, if it has influenced your choice of model in some way, then it is no longer usable as an unbiased estimate of how good your model is. And I apologize to those of you, you know, from California, maybe you're not that familiar with snow, but yeah, once you've driven over the snow a lot, it gets really nasty. It's no good for anything. Not much good for making a snowman or a snowball fight. Okay, so your training set is used to select theta via optimization. It's used to select your optimizer hyperparameters, like your learning rate. Uh, your validation set is used to select your model class, regularize your hyperparameters, which features to use, things like that, basically things that mitigate overfitting. 
and your test set is used for? It's used only to report your final performance and hopefully nothing else. Okay, so uh, summary and some takeaways. Where do errors come from? They come from variance. That's when you have too much capacity, not enough information in the data to find the right parameters. Errors also come from bias, too little capacity, not enough representational power to represent the true function. Error is variance plus bias squared. Overfitting means too much variance. Underfitting means too much bias. How can we trade off bias and variance? Well, select your model class carefully. Try to get the number of parameters to be not so large that you get too much variance. In deep learning, we typically don't bother with this because in deep learning, we want to use very large models. You can also select your features carefully. But again, in deep learning, we often don't bother this with this because in deep learning, we learn from raw inputs. Regularization. That's stuff we add to the loss function, oftentimes to reduce variance, although, as we learn, not always. How do we select hyperparameters? Construct a training and validation split. The training set is used for optimization. The validation set is used for selecting your hyperparameters. And then the test set is used for reporting your final results and nothing else.